chemical kinetics. In this experiment, you will determine the rate of a reaction, order of reactants, and define the rate law for a given reaction experimentally. Chemical kinetics is the study of how quickly a given chemical reaction occurs and the factors that can affect the rate. It essentially describes the speed of a reaction. The definition of reaction rate is the measure of the change in reactant concentration per unit of time. There are many factors that can affect reaction rate, which are listed below. As we know, increasing the temperature is an easy way to increase the rate of a reaction. The concentration of a reactant can also play a role in the rate of a reaction, as well as the physical state, so whether a reactant is in gas, solid, or liquid phase can play a role, and the reaction rate can be affected if there is a catalyst present. Reaction rates can be classified into two categories, the first being independent. In an independent reaction, the rate is independent of the changing concentration of a reactant, and we, we see a linear concentration over time relationship as depicted on the right. This tells us that the amount of reactant use per time does not change. The other category is a dependent reaction rate. This is where the rate depends on the changing concentration of the reactant. When we plot this data, we see a curvilinear concentration over time relationship, as we see on the right. This means that the, reactant get, that the reaction gets slower as our reactants are consumed. We will be using this graphing technique today to visualize what category our reaction falls into with respect to each reactant. Because each reactant can affect the reaction rate differently, we sum it up in what's called a rate law. The rate law tells us the dependence of reaction rate on concentration, and it is given by the expression rate equals K times concentration of A to the power of X times the concentration of B to the power of Y. In this expression, K is the reaction's rate constant. A and B are the concentrations of the reactants in moles per liter, and X and Y are the orders of the reactants A and B respectively. We will determine all of these variables experimentally. Discovering the order of a reactant gives us information about how the concentration of the reactant changes the rate of the reaction. When a reactant is zeroth order, the rate is independent of the concentration of the reactant. This means that experimentally, if you varied your concentration of this reactant, you would see no difference in your reaction rate. When a reaction is zeroth order, it has an exponent of zero and therefore is not shown in the rate law. When a, reaction, when a reactant is first order, it has an exponent of one. This means that if you double the concentration of your reactant, you double your rate. If you half the concentration of your reactant, you half the rate. You see a directly proportional relationship between the concentration of the reactant and the rate. If a reactant is second order, it has an exponent of two. If we double the concentration of the reactant, we will quadruple the rate. And if we were to triple the concentration of the reactant, we would see two to the power of three, so we would see a reaction rate nine times as fast. And you would, a reactant can also have an order greater than second order, such as to the exponent of three or higher. For example, if a third order reactant has its concentration concentration doubled, the rate would increase by a factor of eight. Let's see how we would experimentally determine a rate law. The example we will use is the formation of nitrogen dioxide from nitrogen oxide and oxygen. As we know, our rate law is going to be given by some constant K multiplied by the concentration of NO to some exponent X multiplied by the concentration of O2 to some exponent Y. In order to determine this, we have to run at least three experiments. In the first experiment, we decide on a concentration for NO and O2. In the second experiment, we double the concentration of NO, but leave O2 constant. And in the third experiment, we leave NO the same as the original concentration and double O2. In order to determine the order for NO, we will keep the concentration of O2 constant and compare experiment one to experiment two. To determine the order for O2, we will keep the concentration of NO constant and compare experiment one to experiment three. 
So first, we're going to look at determining the order for NO. So we will isolate X by comparing experiment 2 to experiment 1. It's always easier when you're doing these calculations to put the experiment that has the larger reaction rate and the larger concentration on the numerator. Okay, so we have the rate of reaction 2 over the rate of reaction 1, and we know those values from the table above. So we can replace those values into our rate equations and add in our respective concentrations that were used in the experiment outlined in the table. Now, we can cancel our units and cancel our constant K and our oxygen concentration that was kept constant, and we're left with 4.2. So this number resulted from dividing 0.105 by 0.025. So now we have 4.2 equals 2 to the power of X. Now we have to get X in front of the expression. To do that, we use uh, log laws. So we can take the natural log, ln, and remember that what you do to one side, you must do to the other. So we're left with the expression ln 4.2 equals ln 2.0 to the x. And log rules tell us that the x can be brought down to the front. So we can isolate x by dividing both sides by ln 2, canceling out, and dividing to get x equals 2.07. So we always round to the closest whole number and we get a value of two. This means that NO's order in this reaction is two. So we can go ahead and replace X with two in our rate law expression. Now let's look at O2. This process will be the exact same, except we are comparing experiment one and experiment three. So we'll isolate Y. So we will take our uh, rates from the table above and we can fill them into our expression like on the slide previous and then we will perform our canceling Notice again that we put the reaction with the higher reaction rate on the numerator to make our calculations easier So after canceling our units and our constant K and our concentration of uh, NO because it's the same in both experiments We're left with 2 equals 2 to the power of Y So we can use ln again to isolate y, so we're going to uh, take y down to the front and then divide by ln 2 on both sides. And then we can cancel and get y equals 1. So this means that our oxygen has an order of 1 and we can change y to 1 in our rate law expression. Now that we know our order of reaction, now that we know our orders of reactants, we can determine the rate constant K. To do this, we rearrange the equation to isolate K as seen here, and we replace all of our variables with information in the table from experiment one. We're able to cancel our units and calculate to find that K equals 12,500 moles per liter to the minus two times seconds to the minus one. And then we're able to calculate this for each experiment and find an average value of K to be used in the rate equation. So from all of our calculations, we have discovered that the reaction is second order for NO and first order for O2. So in order to determine the overall, react, um, overall order, you add the two together. So two plus one means the reaction is a third overall order. Okay, so now on to the experimental procedure. You will be working in pairs. It's extremely important to label all of your glassware prior to getting your chemicals, as well as make sure to set up all your stands and clamps prior to getting your pipettes. Pipette the required amounts of HCl and water into beakers labeled one to six and four mils of sodium thiosulfate into a 10 mil beaker. It's important that you pipette into a beaker and not straight into the reaction beaker because your reaction times will be affected if it is a slow release rather than um, dumping in all of the so sodium thiosulfate at the same time. And make sure to place one labeled 100 ml beaker over the X on the provided piece of paper. So pour your sodium thiosulfate into the HCl solution and record the time it takes for that X to completely disappear. 
It's important to be consistent from run to run and make sure you look straight down at the beaker and uh, keep that same position uh, to the beaker from run to run. And repeat this with fresh aliquots of sodium thiosulfate sulfate for each HCl solution, recording the time for each. Here's an example of what your reac reaction will look like, and you want to stop the timer when it appears like the beaker on the far right. You can no longer see the X. It's important that as soon as you stop the timer, you take the beaker and empty the contents into the provided waste container in the fume hood, and place the beaker in hot soapy water to soak while you continue on with the experiment. Once trial a is complete, trial B is the exact same except with reagents reversed. You will pipette the required amounts of sodium thiosulfate sulfate and water into 100 ml beakers labeled 9 to 12. You will then dispense 4 ml of HCl into a clean 10 ml beaker. Record the time it takes for X to completely disappear. Remember to empty the contents into the fume hood waste beaker and put your beaker into hot soapy water. Repeat this with fresh aliquots of HCl in the same 10 ml beaker for each sodium thiosulfate solution, recording the time for each. For cleanup, make sure to rinse all glassware with warm soapy water, taking care to remove all labels and scrub the insides of the beakers. Rinse your glassware three times with warm tap water and three times with DI. Make sure that your glassware is checked before returning your bins to your locker and the 100 ml beakers to the wet bench area. For calculations, you will be calculating the concentration of sodium thiosulfate sulfate and HCl for each solution. Make sure to consider the total volume when your water is added. You will be calculating the average times for each solution, calculating the reaction rate for each solution from the average reaction time, so note that to calculate your rate, you take the inverse of time, so one over time. Tabulate the concentration of HCl, average reaction time and reaction rate in Excel. Tabulate the concentration of sodium thiosulfate, sulfate, average reaction time and reaction rate in Excel. So using the concentrations and average reaction rate values, you can calculate the orders for both HCl and sodium thiosulfate sulfate using the expression on the right. Uh, so just another reminder, make sure to place the run with a larger concentration or larger reaction rate on top and it will make your math easier. Once you find your reaction orders, you can derive the rate law for the reaction and determine K and remember that the rate law is given by rate equals K multiplied by the concentration of A to the power of X multiplied by the concentration of B to the power of Y. And your calculated results can be compared to your, um, your graphed results. Okay, so you will be making two graphs with your data. The first will be a concentration versus time graph with concentration on the Y axis and time on the X. So you will have to uh, give them two trend lines and a legend, and uh, you have to choose whether you want to have a linear power or exponential trend line. So you have to test out each one and find which one you think looks the best. And so this graph here is hypothetical. It's not actual results from the experiment, but yours may look similar to it. Your second graph will be rate versus concentration. You will have rate on the y-axis, noting that the units are seconds to the minus one, and concentration on the x. So looking at the graph with respect to sodium thiosulfate, thiol sulfate, the reaction is zero order. And that's because when we change the concentration, we see that the reaction rate doesn't change. So that's how we know that it's zero order. With respect to HCl, it is first order, and that's because we see a linear increasing line. So as we increase um, our concentration, our rate increases um, directly. So it's a proportionality. And a little reminder, it's not necessarily actual results. So you'll be using your graphs to compare, but uh, we'll be determining the orders from uh, calculating them from your actual data. Okay, so how to put two trend lines on the same graph. First, you will graph 
the concentration and time data for your HCL data, and then move your graph to a new chart, as we normally do, and physically right-click on the HCL data points on the graph. Choose Select Data from the drop-down menu, and it will look like this. You can then select Add to add a new series to your graph. Okay, so now you can enter the series name as sodium thiosulfate, and then next select the X values, um, so your concentration of sodium thiosulfate from the Excel data sheet, and then select the Y values, average time from the same Excel data sheet. So in order to select those, you click the red arrow to the right of the box, and then use the left mouse button to drag and highlight all the values you want to include for X. And then do the same for the Y and highlight the values that you want to include. Okay, so now you can edit the first series and rename it to HCL. So you just click on it and you press edit, and then you can enter the name that you want so you will enter HCL. And now you can click OK to view your graph. And now you can edit it um, to make it look good with the correct major and minor axes, labeling, insert appropriate trend lines, and make sure to include units. And then repeat this procedure for graph number two. So this is a summary of what will be added to each beaker. In beakers 1 to 6, you will be varying the volume of HCl and making the volume up to 10 mils with water. The sodium thiosulfate will be dispensed into a 10 mil beaker. And then in beakers 7 to 12, the sodium thiosulfate volume will be varied and made up to 10 mils with water. And the HCl will be dispensed into a 10 mil beaker.